Uh, right here in Midday Jazz and Justice. Again, I'm Jared Ball, your host. More importantly, this is WPFW 89.3 FM. Uh, joining us at least for the first hour, and uh, let me just let everybody know, for, we were initially planning to have uh, Dr. Joseph on for the full two hours. He's had an emergency uh, that is going to take him away for at least half of that. Uh, so we're going to hold off on our phone calls until the second hour where you all can respond to our discussion uh, that we're going to have in this first hour. Uh, and you can let us know where each of us has gone wrong. Uh, and just up front, we want to let folks know we're going to give emphasis and room to those in the second hour who have listened to the first hour and have a response to that as opposed to some of our dear brothers, uh, in particular our, our brothers from the, uh, representing c c um, uh, criticism of the CBC and discussions of Ethiopia, we're going to ask that you hold off or make your comments relevant to this particular program, although often your comments are, are very powerful and indeed wanted. Um, again, okay, so let's just get right into it. Uh, Peniel Joseph is professor of history at Tufts University and the author of Waiting Till the Midnight Hour and editor of the Black Power Movement and Neighborhood Rebels. The recipient of fellowships from Harvard University's Charles Warren Center, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and the Ford Foundation, his essays have appeared in the Journal of American History, the Chronicle Review, the New York Times, and American Historical Review. He lives in Somerville, Massachusetts, and joins us from there uh, by phone this afternoon to talk about his new book, Dark Days, Bright Nights, From Black Power to Barack Obama. Welcome, Professor Joseph, to the program. Thank you for having me. Well, let's just get started. Um, we have uh, off air, off the line, um, exchanged a few uh, um, brief discussions of disagreement. Uh, and But let me let you go first and just lay out what it is that you have attempted to do here in this book. Uh, what is the primary thesis uh, and your defense of it? And then uh, we'll go from there. Well, certainly. Um, the, the book has multiple uh, arguments, um, but one strand of the argument is this. Um, when we think about uh, Barack Obama's election and the campaign season, which really covers two years, it was a two-year campaign, both 2007 and 2008, even though the election was November 4th, 2008, um, both Obama, his campaign, and prognosticators placed him squarely within the tradition of civil rights. I mean, Obama quoted uh, from one of King's m more militant speeches in the late 60s, uh, The Fierce Urgency of Now. Um, King was talking about militarism, materialism, and racism, uh, but Obama just took a little snippet of that when people were asking him why he was going to run. Uh, in 2007, in March, in Selma, he, he, he declared himself part of a Joshua generation. Um, he initially had a star-crossed relationship with civil rights activists like Andy Young and John Lewis, and Vernon Jordan, um, but eventually they came around. Um, and really, many, many media pundits and journalists uh, were, were talking about the way in which African Americans viewed a potential Obama presidency as really a fulfillment of the legacy of, of Dr. King's dream of a colorblind America. So one strand that you saw throughout the election was Obama as sort of completing um, or a concluding chapter of our national civil rights saga. And in contrast, you really, except for in a negative context, black power was never brought up, either by the candidate himself or by most uh, commentators. And in a sense, um, the way in which the black power movement was equally pivotal to, br to transforming race relations and bringing us up to the point where uh, we could have a black presidential nominee and a serious candidate, that, that was really over, overlooked. The only time black power was talked about uh, during the campaign was, was usually in a negative light, uh, uh, connecting Jeremiah Wright to, to racial extremism, and even the candidate himself uh, in an interview with Newsweek in the summer of 2007, then Senator Obama, when people were discussing whether or not he was black enough to be president, that people were caught up in uh, the 1960s and sort of black power racial identity uh, politics. So what Dark Days, Bright Nights um, argues is really a couple of things. One, uh, black power is pivotal to transforming American democratic institutions and American democracy to the point where side, side by side with the civil rights movement, we, we, we could have an African-American um, president. Uh, so, so one thing it tries to really forcefully argue that whether or not Obama acknowledges the legacy of black power in his rise, 
um, he's a product of both movements, whether or not he wants to acknowledge it. Even though he's not a product of, um, he's not representative of the anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist strain of black power, he certainly has utilized the, the transformations that that strain and other more moderate and pragmatic strains really set in motion, um, whether we're thinking about um, uh, black elected officials, whether we're thinking about black studies, whether we're thinking about the way in which black identity is just redefined in a whole-scale way, and even really American identity. We only have uh, notions of multiculturalism and diversity right now because of black power, even though at times those contemporary discussions don't lead to the conclusions that more radical or revolutionary black power uh, activists um, articulated. Um, another strand of argument in the book, and this continues a, an argument that I laid out in my first book, was that really when we think about um, democracy in the post-war period, that black radicalism and black radicals like Malcolm X and Stokely Carmichael were pivotal to transforming American democracy, even as they were some of the sharpest critics of American democracy uh, during that time period. And then, and then finally, another strand, and I'll, I'll close with this, is really when we think about um, the last chapter where I really discuss Obama and race and democracy, I think one of the um, stories that was left out of Obama's rise was the way in which black, black uh, progressive politics and radical politics of the 1980s, and here we're thinking about Harold Washington and Jesse Jackson, really set the stage for Obama as well. And Jesse certainly has become a sort of national caricature 26 years after the 1984 presidential campaign. But in their own ways, those campaigns in 84 and 88 were very, very heroic and very, very instrumental. This doesn't mean that Jesse didn't have flaws or shortcomings, but they really uh, transformed the tenor of, of Democratic uh, primary politics. And they actually led to rules changes um, that, that really forego the winner-take-all system and went to congressional representation, which allowed Obama to be the candidate. So when we looked at the election, most people looked at Jesse as this anachronistic figure, this figure who never had a chance to, to, uh, to, to win. I remember Larry King Live was talking to Snoop Dogg, the rapper, and, and Snoop was saying, well, you know, Jesse never had a chance to win, and Larry is just shaking his head yes, and Snoop becomes sort of the historian of the black community. Uh, to this national audience, yet yet Jesse's uh, campaigns are really instrumental in really um, setting up the terrain that gives uh, Obama his chance. And certainly Harold Washington is key here, too, because Harold Washington really is a black power mayor in Chicago and a continuation of the, that black power movement against the backdrop of the Reagan legacy, and he wins in 1983. And, and it's really Harold Washington, Chicago, that a young Barack Obama comes to when he's, you know, 22 years old in 1984 after doing some community um, organizing work with some students in New York City. So um, the, the, the argument that's laid out here is, you know, the, the way in which black power is really instrumental to um, the, the transforming the landscape that led to the rise of, of Barack Obama. This is WPFW 89.3 FM, Midday Jazz and Justice. I'm Jared Ball, your host. You were just listening to Dr. Peniel Joseph, um, who is here this afternoon to talk with us about his latest book, Dark Days, Bright Nights, From Black Power to Barack Obama. Uh, so what I'd like to do is, is if I can, I want to just give you um, and our listeners a quick response, and then we have to take a quick break, and then we'll come back, and you can respond to my response, and we can get into some of more of the details of the book. Uh, but just as, just to catch our, our listeners up, I, I just want to let them know that you and I first came to interact uh, doing an interview for this very uh, radio station uh, for one of your previous books. Uh, and then later you came to Morgan State University where I currently teach and you were giving a, a lecture on black power uh, if, to, uh, before the university. Uh, and you and this is in 2008 and you made statements um, that uh, uh, alluding to the fact that you thought that Dr. King was, an, uh, uh, that rather that Obama was an extension of the civil rights movement and Dr. King, and then that in fact he was black power. 
Uh, you and I had a, a, a brief discussion of disagreement about that, a subsequent one at the Smithsonian, uh, and, and where you showed us um, the uh, what is now the current cover of the book, which includes a picture of Barack Obama at a rally with American flags waving behind him, for those who haven't seen it, then the lettering of the, the text of the title of the book, and then underneath it, uh, Malcolm X speaking at a Nation of Islam rally. Uh, and I told you then that I, I thought that that was a little bit misleading, uh, given that the titles from Black Power to Barack Obama give this idea that he is an extension there uh, of that movement. So I just want to read you this quick statement uh, that I have just quickly put together as an introduction, and then, uh, like I said, we'll have to take a quick break, and then you can come back and uh, respond as you as you see fit. Um, so I just put together here that an honest and accurate recitation of Black Power, its founders, and most ardent theoreticians and activists could only conclude that Obama is a systemic response to black power, its antithesis, a carefully crafted adaptation, as capitalism and white supremacy are known for, to threatening movements. He is a neo-colonial imposition, as opposed to a radical movement's successful culmination. Through carefully su selected points of emphasis, the reader of Dark Days, Bright Nights is left to conclude that Obama is progress evolving from black power, a new and improved black power, a culmination of a successful movement to grow progressively from an immature, anachronistic uh, politics to a mature, modern form of radicalism. The reader is forced to conclude that, as you say uh, at the end of your book, all things are possible, that the politics of hope and res racial reconciliation unleashed in Americans of all backgrounds, end quote, is somehow a positive, genuine, fact-based, sensible emotion as opposed to a part of a propagandistic, systemic response to black power developed by a nation whose only response to genuine democracy and equality has ever been hostile and violent. And all of this is imposed on readers who currently live in a world that has seen every material indicator demonstrate the continuity, even worsening, of problems faced by black people and others. In the end, of, in the, end the book reads as a more a contribution to the current and dominant delusion of progress and to equally delusional notions of that the black power movement of Malcolm X and Kwame Ture is somehow antiquated as opposed to still correct in its analysis and necessary as standards of political organization. Because of the pains taken to rewrite Malcolm X and Kwame Ture as espousing a brand of politics that can be identified in Obama, even as there are as many uh, 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 statements distinguishing Obama from Malcolm X and Kwame Ture, it seems that a more fruitful and revealing recitation of that history would be to conclude that black power and Obama are mutually exclusive and hostile to one another, and then let the reader decide for herself whether or not this is good or bad. Further, because of the carefully developed points of emphasis in crafting a redefinition of black power, one suited to the most conservative elements of black or white society, that the book would be more honest were it to have Nixon pictured on the cover rather than Malcolm X, since it's a, it is a Nixonian definition of black power that is applied therein, and it would be, it would have been, it would have to be in order to conclude that Obama is, in fact, black power. The book, finally, is, very skillful, is a very skillful attempt to reconcile what cannot and should not be. Uh, so I've said that. I've, I've you know, given a quick overview of my concern. Uh, we'll come back after this quick break and let Dr. Joseph respond, um, and then we'll move on with the rest of the program. Again, welcome uh, to him and to you. This is Midday Jazz and Justice on WPFW 89.3 FM. I'm Jared Ball, your host. We'll be back in just a minute with much more from Dr. Joseph uh, and Midday Jazz and Justice. Don't go anywhere. Peace. Midday Jazz and Justice, WPFW 89.3 FM. Just a little bit there from Eyes on the Prize, Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael, talking about the history and the development of the popular uh, phrase, Black Power. Uh, we're joined this afternoon uh, by Dr. Peniel Joseph, uh, whose new book, Dark Days, Bright Nights, From Black Power to Barack Obama, is the subject of our discussion. Uh, he gave his brief intro of what uh, the book uh, is meant to convey. I gave a quick response. And now, uh, Dr. Joseph, we welcome you back to the program, and uh, and I offer you a chance to tell me, uh, you know, respond to what it, it was that I had to say. Well, certainly, I think I think it's a misrepresentation to say somehow um, I've I've tried to write about a Nixonian version of Black Power and then say that Obama represents that. I, I never argue in the book that Obama somehow represents uh, Malcolm X's version of Black Power or Stokely right. Carmichael's version. Of black power. In fact, I do something very, very different. What I do is say that both Stokely and Malcolm actually transform the landscape of American race relations. Now, 
in our contemporary times, most critics say they transformed it for the worse. I actually argue the exact opposite. I say when you look at somebody like Malcolm X um, between 1952 and 1965, which are his years of activism, he actually transforms it for the better by leading a parallel movement that is alongside of the heroic period of the civil rights movement of black power activists in places like New York and Detroit and other places that becomes a national movement. And what's interesting about Malcolm and Stokely is that both of those movements that they're a part of actually intersect and interact with civil rights. One of the uh, national misconceptions by both conservatives and radicals is this notion that civil rights and black power were mutually exclusive. That's far from the case. In fact, sometimes activists from one camp switch to the other. Sometimes activists straddled both camps. So what's interesting is when you look at somebody like Barack Obama, he's not coming out of the anti-imperialist, uh, radical, revolutionary strain, but there were other strains of black power as well. And so the, the notion that somehow... Um, like Har- Harold Washington, for instance, um, I don't think uh, most progressives would say he was somehow some neo-imperialist or any of the kind of slogans that you are using, but it, it's too didactic to say that. Where, where, where some people could say, okay, unless you are a Black Panther or unless you are part of um, African Liberation Support Committee or, or Karenga's movement, or unless you were this anti-poverty worker or welfare rights activist, you, you, you were a sellout during the 60s and 70s, and you weren't part of the black power movement. My argument is black power has a much more panoramic cast of characters. Now, this doesn't mean that there weren't important ideological distinctions. So if anything, Obama represents um, moderate, pragmatic, sometimes even with conservative tendencies that saw black power as really black faces in higher places. Now, that being said, the very fact that he could become senator and president is not just a product of the Voting Rights Act. It's also a product of the way in which black power actually transforms American identity at the local, regional, and national level. And so part of the argument of the book is confronting the contradictions of post-war American democracy, confronting the contradictions of the black freedom struggle, and really forcing someone like Obama to realize the debt that he owes to these, these legacies of not just civil rights, but of black power, and the interesting ways that they intertwine and they interbraid each other. So the notion that somehow he's um, imperialism in blackface is extraordinarily didactic, because one of the things that Stokely and Malcolm were great about and why they're such transformative figures is that their thinking evolves over time. If Kwame Ture was alive today, his thinking wouldn't necessarily reflect the same thinking as 66 or 76 or 86. And if Malcolm X was alive today, his thinking wouldn't reflect the way in which he thought it in 1964 or 1965. So the notion that um, you know, we had this uh, quote-unquote correct analyses in the 1950s and 60s, and somehow um, this book misrepresents that and tries to make it converge with, with again, words like neo-imperialism, and, 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 and some kind of, uh, you know, we, we can, critics can call Obama um, a neo-fascist, a neo-imperialist. It doesn't make it so. It actually means that people are looking um, and trying to use uh, uh, totalizing words instead of really looking at the nuance. I mean, is there a difference between Obama's policies on a point-by-point level with previous administrations? That's, that's, how, that's how people um, come to any kind of sophisticated and complex analysis. I mean, by the time one says that this guy is just imperialism and blackface, we know that we've, we've, we've lost the ability to really have a dialogue. Well, it depends. And all we're doing is just, is just, is just we're, we're sloganeering, and we're saying, hey, you know, this, this guy is, 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 is the imperialist in blackface. Okay. Where he, whatever, whatever word you want to um, use, and especially words coming out of the 60s, we can say this guy represents the white power structure. We, we can say all those things, but, well, but, but, they, but, but the, the, point, the point is the, the, the book does not have some kind of facile uh, uh, interpretation that Obama represents a leaner, meaner version of, of, of Malcolm or, or Stokely Carmichael Kwame Ture. In fact, it, it, it says quite the opposite and actually very, very forcefully says that Obama 
um, has a misunderstanding of both civil rights and black power. It very forcefully says that. It says that this is somebody who has a romantic image of civil rights as sort of this interracial uh, movement, when in fact most whites did not participate in the civil rights movement. This is somebody who has a misunderstanding of black power and of black nationalism, where he, he thinks black nationalism is completely narrow nationalism and racial separatism, where people like Malcolm and Kwame Ture were not conventional or simplistic racial separatists. And the book really says that when you think about Harold Washington, who even Obama writes about in Dreams from My Father, that he comes of political age in Harold Washington, Chicago, that Harold Washington is actually an extension of the black power movement. And it also says that um, Jeremiah Wright and, and his articulation of black liberation theology is coming out of the black power movement. So it actually confronts Obama's own contradictions and his own misunderstanding of the politics of the 60s, even as he tries to uphold a very specific version of the politics of the 60s, both in his campaign and his presidency. All right, there's a lot of interesting things. We're talking to Dr. Peniel Joseph this afternoon on Midday Jazz and Justice on WPFW. There's a number of things here that, that in, your, in your response that speak to my concern. One, I never said, uh, in fact, I acknowledge that you go to great pains to demonstrate that Obama is not the black power of Malcolm and Kwame Ture, which is why I was raising the question about putting Malcolm on the cover or even calling it uh, from black power to Barack Obama as opposed to something else. Um, this you, you also do throughout the book use phrases, you know, you, you, you know, you refer to what I said as sloganeering, uh, but you in the, in the book do a lot of the same thing. You use the phrase radical transformation of American democracy. Uh, dozens of times as a as a um, uh, as a slogan of progress, you use the phrase uh, racial. Well, it's not a slogan of progress. Hold on, hold on, I, hold on, I, hold on. I, I break down hold what on, I mean by that. Hold on, hold on. I understand that, but you keep. But again, that's like I said in, in my initial statement. You very skillfully attempt to reconcile what I think cannot be. And my point is that that you you turn a black power international. Uh, in many ways, socialist, anti-imperialist struggle into something that is about a, quote, radical transformation of American democracy, as opposed to a destruction or recognition that this has never been a democracy. It's not now, nor has it ever been. It was not intended by the founders to be one, and they went to themselves to great pains to make sure it wasn't. Uh, and Malcolm and Stokely both worked very hard to uh, highlight that. You referred to, again, what I was saying is sloganeering. I use words that Obama himself used. So Obama himself, in his speech, uh, in Ghana used the word neocolonialism only to say that it can't be used to blame the current conditions of Africa on the West, uh, that African leaders in their corrupt this uh, are to be blamed for the backwardness of, of uh, or the lack of development in Africa, which is against, I think, again, uh, um, it's anti-historical, it's anti it's, it's, it goes against um, current uh, contemporary analysis of what's happening in Africa. So my use of language is something that he used himself. Now, let me just be very clear uh, to you and to the listeners. Again, this is WPFW, Midday Jazz and Justice. Um, my reason for, for highlighting Nixon is because here on page uh, 200, 201 of your book, um, you say you say very clearly, although Barack Obama is hardly the kind of black politician who would garner the approval of 1960s era militants, his candidacy, candidacy represents a strand of black power too often ignored. You go on to say that black politicians, business leaders and corporate aspirants defined black power as a quest for economic and political power rather than a third world revolution. Obama's willingness to seek the nation's highest office after barely two years on the national political scene embodies the boldness and, um, and politics of self-determination that were a hallmark of black power era politics. Um, now, again, I think that is, again, as I said in my opening statement, selective emphasis, because um, uh, it's interesting to define self-determination as something that is ultimately the, the, uh, the most heavily Wall Street funded political candidacy in history or the selection and support of the Democratic uh, um, Leadership Council or the Democratic Party uh, uh, courting you and, and funding you and determining throughout their hidden primaries in the 1990s that you were a candidate that they wanted to put up, put forth uh, it, to define that is self-determination. But more specifically, and I'm, I'm quoting here from Black Awakening in Capitalist America, Robert Allen's book, where he talks about Nixon making this um, uh, uh, determination to, to redefine black power. And he says in, in, a, in a speech or in a radio interview from March 28, 1968, in what Allen describes as the first public pronouncement of this redefinition, 
Uh, Nixon says, I speak not of black power as some of the extremists would interpret it, not the power of hate and division, not the power of cynical racism, but the power of the people, uh, the power the people should have over their own destinies, the power to affect their own communities, the power that comes from participation in the political and economic process of society, end quote. He goes on to say that this is, that bringing black people into the corporate boardrooms and into the electoral politics, particularly of the, of the Democratic Party, was, um, well, I guess not really, not the particular Democratic Party, but of the two dominant parties, um, was was to to stem the tide of a coming rebellion. So my point is that you've you've again very skillfully redefined black power into its most conservative elements to attach Obama to it, as opposed of leaving the standard at what um, at the standard developed by those who are its most. Uh, uh, ardent proponents, those who theorized it, developed it as a as a as a as a theory and an action, uh, who have been put to the margins in terms of the standard for def- defining black power, and I'm just not sure why it was necessary to do that. Well, I just, I mean, I, I mean, obviously, I disagree with you. I think that w- w- one of the reasons why, again, the book even spends so much time on Malcolm and Stokely is to show what the standard is. But there's two there's two things that you're 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 missing here. One. Um, I, I craft the way in which the politics of people like Malcolm and Stokely actually have their own unintended consequences, like all social movements. So one of the unintended consequences are there's going to be different aspects and different points of emphasis. Even before Malcolm X, I mean, you're going to have people like Donald Warden and the Afro-American Association. You're going to have different groups that are talking about um, self-determination, including the Nation of Islam. So even, you know, before that 1968, we can't, w- one of the things that sometimes critics do, and I, I, I think Black Awakening in Capitalist America is a classic, but this notion that somehow it's through Nixon and a speech that there's a whole aspect that gets re, re, um, re you know, redefined, I, I think that's an erroneous notion because there's always been... No, a redefinition a, 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 of the a, phrase black power is what I'm talking about, though. You, we're not talking about... I understand that there's been self-determining efforts in the black community throughout history, yeah, but, 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 but use of the phrase the black power... Which is a key black power organization, at least under Malcolm X, um, um, was talking about a politics of self-determination, uh, did not want Malcolm or any of their followers to, to be involved in any boycotts or, 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 or sit-ins or demonstrations, yet Malcolm was, was fighting against that, which is one of the reasons the organization and him had to come to a parting of the way. So I think... I think but again, he wasn't doing this under the banner of a phrase, black power. The, you know, again, but, that's why I'm saying that the here, title here, and the picture here's, on here's the cover is a little one misleading. thing that we have to remember. Even as um, Nixon is trying to redefine it. There's going to be different black power activists who are militants, whose militancy might not be of the same ideological orientation as Kwame Ture and as Malcolm X, but whose whose definition of black power is also not impacted or corrupted by Richard Nixon. That's the whole thing. The notion that Richard Nixon somehow, um, because of that speech and because of connections to, say, uh, Floyd McKissick and Soul City, um, corrupts uh, the entire movement. I mean, I, I don't. I don't. That's think not that's what I was saying. I, what I, I was saying was true. that there, what I was and, saying was that there's a systemic and intentional decision among those in the, the the power elite to redefine a popular phrase being used to encourage black rebelliousness and black uh, uh, rejection of this system, economic and social system, into something that could be used to blunt that oncoming developing movement. That's all, that's what, that's the point I'm trying to make. So that if you are trying to, as I think you do, and that's why I think you, that's why I'm, I'm saying it's interesting and curious that but, but you would I'm use not Malcolm. I'm a chance to respond. I mean, it's okay. your show, but I'm not getting a chance I, to respond. I thought you had given, given a chance. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Please, please go ahead. Um, w- w- one, of the, one of the points that I make throughout this this book, Dark Days, Bright Nights, and the reason why it's called From Black Power to Barack Obama is that the subtitle is not misleading at all. What the subtitle points to is the way in which um, American race relations has transformed uh, so significantly um, at least a tenor of it in some ways. I mean, it doesn't mean that in terms of social economic indicators, uh, blacks are disproportionately uh, represented, overrepresented in all the worst ones, whether it's criminal justice system or HIV or wh- what have you. At the same time, uh, we, we do have um, more proportional wealth than we did 45 years ago. At the same time, there is That's not true. Um, more, more, well, well in, terms, in terms of, in terms of um, people who represent uh, African American power brokers and CEOs and corporate and and political power. We have more black elected officials now than we did 
uh, 45 years ago. But you said you said you said holders of wealth, and the wealth in this country is more highly concentrated among a tiny white elite than ever in the history. And we have the same wealth uh, uh, percentage-wise that we had in 1860, 1865, one tenth of one percent, or one half of one percent. Yeah, but in terms so, of in terms of real dollar value, Jared, we, you're saying we have less now than we did in 1860. That less less of the less percentage of the national wealth. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. That's what Dr. Claude Anderson has said. Uh, and if we look at if we look at the there, there's a correlation between um, the well let's put wealth aside so we don't go down the rabbit hole in terms of race well, relations have transformed at least to the point where we have more um, um, power brokers black people who are representing uh, the highest levels of corporate and political power uh, since the 1960s. But that was never the goal of the black power movement. Well, it, for, for a strand of it, it was. For, for Malcolm and for it, Stokely, it wasn't. For a strand of it, it was. For but, a no, for, of it, it was. For those so, who developed so, the phrase black power, it wasn't. That's, the, that's what I'm saying is the point here. If you wanted to write a book defining black power as the more conservative element, then I think you should have spent time with your chapters developing that not with Malcolm and not with Stokely or, or, putting, or, or not putting them on the cover or no, even no, using the, the phrase. You're, you're, no, That's why you're, I was you're saying missing it's the point of the book. I mean, the whole the the point is to talk about the way in which these black power icons like Stokely, like Malcolm, are not giving credit with transforming these institutions in American society. Whether we're talking about um, higher education, whether we're talking about elected officials, whether we're talking about just American culture since the post-war period. So the notion that um, uh, just because Obama does not represent uh, the exact strain of Malcolm and Kwame Touré doesn't mean that he's not an example of unintended consequences of their legacies, because that's the whole point. The whole point is when you think about Obama, Obama was foisting himself into a continuum of this, this long civil rights movement and really not saying that part of that legacy is really the way in which black power forcibly did things like when we think about the first generation of African-American elected officials, uh, when we think about the creation of, of, of black studies departments and programs across the country, the black student movement, when we think about Kwame Ture and the anti-war movement, when we think about the whole notion of the only reason why uh, African-Americans are calling themselves black and Afro-American and not Negro and colored is because of that black power movement and how even in the 1980s that continues and it doesn't go from protest to politics it's protest and politics in the 1980s whether it's campaigns against apartheid in South Africa which 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 Obama tried to be a part of at Occidental or or it's it's the movement to elect Harold Washington or Jesse Jackson or or what have you so what what the the, the point of emphasizing Malcolm and Stokely and really this reimagining of the black power movement is that even as the black power movement in its most revolutionary edges anti-capitalist anti-imperialist part of that movement was also trying to very pragmatically transform institutions where they were thinking about um, uh, black panthers and survival programs and breakfast programs and health clinics or we're thinking about anti-poverty uh, black women, whether they're in Baltimore and Philadelphia, New Orleans, being part of local ad hoc black power organizations. So it was very, very pragmatic and radical simultaneously. So okay. one of the things that Obama represents, and this is different from saying Obama's just a representation of Nixon's corrupted uh, vision and reimagining of black power, is that there were conservative and moderate and pragmatic um, tensions right that uh, were with, highlighted within, within and promoted but, specifically to re- weaken the more radical elements. That's the but, point. But, no, I think no, you keep. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, Dr. Joseph. We have to. We, first of all, I have to take a quick break, and then we'll come back. But but uh, there has to be time for me to respond as well. So so with that, we're going to hold right there. That's Dr. Peniel Joseph talking with us about his new book, Dark Days, Bright Nights, from Black Power to Barack Obama. This is Midday Jazz and Justice. More importantly, this is WPFW eighty nine point three FM. We'll be back to wrap this up in just a minute. Don't go anywhere. Peace. All right, W. PFW 89.3 FM, Midday Jazz and Justice. Uh, we'll get that cart fixed and come back to it in just a minute. But we're wrapping up here with Dr. Peniel Joseph talking to us about his new book, uh, Dark Days, Bright Nights from Black Power to Obama. Uh, and unfortunately, we have to keep this limited to just one hour so that he can get his um, emergencies dealt with. And I do hope you get that corrected as soon as possible. Good luck with that. I do understand the issues of home ownership uh, can be serious. Um, let me just say this very quickly. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you said Stokely or Kwame Ture and Malcolm X would have uh, revised their their um, 
you know, analysis in today's world. And, and that's obviously we, we can never fully tell, uh, particularly in Malcolm X's case. Um, but it's also important to note that he was assassinated primarily uh, because of his stance on the more radical end of what is what is black power as opposed to the more conservative tradition. Uh, Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture argued that at the end, that you know, throughout his life that the FBI gave him the cancer that ultimately killed him, uh, primarily because he did not soften or go to the more conservative end. And I just want to read what is really just the last paragraph in his autobiography, uh, written in, in 1998, which is an ancient history. Um, and, uh, and it was his last statement that he wanted to leave us with. Uh, so he says, why, why, in short, is the United States of America not the great humane country it is so easily and could and ought to be? Uh, perhaps it is only spending time away, meaning away from the country, that makes it easier for me to see these ominous changes so clearly. But I think, think you all had better start paying serious attention. For what I'm afraid I'm seeing is a society in deep moral crisis, not democracy, not even plutocracy, but outright kleptocracy. As, a, as vulgar as that of Mobutu's Congo, where both so-called political parties are totally owned subsidiaries of an increasingly predatory, cynical, irresponsible, and immoral corporate sector who then defends, who then defends the public interests. The citizens, the common people, friends, no matter what lies they tell you, the private grieve, greed of cartels of self-interested individuals can never result in a humane, rational, functional, just, decent, and civilized society. It never has and never will. That is why I say despite its apparent power and precisely because of its excesses, American capitalism is weaker today than it ever has been. Uh, it is, I think, end quote, and to, it's a response to this that I think the system uh, developed because you, keep, you, 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 you outline this idea that Obama made, as you say, an audacious, I mean, an audacious candidacy, uh, a decision on his own, when in fact, as Paul Street and others have identified in their books on, on Obama's history, he, it is very clearly that it was the corporate sector that called and developed him throughout the 90s, much like they had done with Bill Clinton prior to that, and seen, seen him as a worthy representative of the very forces that Kwame Ture was asking us to be mindful of at the end of his life. So I think it is easy to say, more so in his case, that is Ture's, that he would have been an ardent critic of what people are now saying is, is the success and happiness and, and hopefulness in a President Obama. Um, and I think it is, again, why, you know, my concern about what is, again, as, as I said, a skillful attempt, in your case, to reconcile what cannot be, that you have chosen to focus on rewriting Malcolm X and, 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 and Kwame Ture with points of emphasis that, that highlight this self-determination aspect of black power, which was, which was for Malcolm and Kwame Ture a collective self-determination. It was not about an individual uh, walking off into uh, the highest levels of the political elite well, well, uh, well, and with here, corporate sponsorship and Wall Street I mean, sponsorship. One, I mean, I'm, I'm working on a biography of Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture right now. So I'm, I'm very, very aware of, of um, for, after studying for years um, Kwame Torrey's writings and speeches and interviewing people and, 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 and doing primary research on, on, on Kwame Torrey. So um, that, that statement that he made uh, contains um, obviously many good points. At the same time, Kwame Torrey was a very, very supple thinker, somebody who, who looked at things in a very, very wide lens. And so my point about both Kwame Torrey and Malcolm X is that their thinking evolved over time. Okay, so they never stayed stagnant or static. Um, in terms of this notion of trying to uh, uh, voice some kind of conservative definition of black power to make it align with um, Barack Obama, that's just, it's, it's not true. I mean, if you read the book, and I, I know have. you read it, but I mean, um, the, the, to me, that's a misinterpretation and a misunderstanding of the book's central argument. If anything, the book argues and lays out a case that instead of turning uh, the, your back on black power and sort of, sort of um, marginalizing these radicals, uh, that these radicals are actually pivotal to social and political transformation and progress in the United States and globally, and even as it acknowledges that their work is left undone and unfinished, it doesn't try to marginalize or put on the margins or the fringes their most radical criticisms of the United States. In fact, I highlight that. I highlight that and say that even, even they're, they're some of the biggest critics of the United States, but in doing so, they help in terms of a dialogue and a debate over race, over war, over democracy. And this whole notion, I mean, I start out chapter two 
um, since we're, we're reading stuff from the book. I start out Chapter 2 with a quote from Malcolm, um, and the chapter is called Malcolm X, Harlem, and American Democracy, and this is 1964. Malcolm says, whenever a Negro fights for democracy, he's fighting for something he has not got, never had, and never will have. And so the, the point of that whole chapter, in fact, is to look at how Malcolm, in a very, very meticulous way, over the course of his 13-year political public career, actually confronts democracy, talks about that word, challenges sitting presidents from Eisenhower to Nixon to LBJ, is really somebody who's, who's knowledgeable about the civil rights situation, is, is in Washington, D.C. from Muslim Mosque Number 4, criticizing what's going on in Birmingham, somebody who is, is intimately involved in the U.N. demonstrations on February 15, 1961, um, um, and the U.N. uprising against the murder of Patrice Lumumba. So the, the, the anti-imperialist, the, the, the critique of American democracy, the sharp, vociferous, revolutionary critique is there throughout. I mean, so if anything, what the book argues is that the robust, radicalism of both Malcolm X and Stokely Carmichael, some of the unintended consequences is actually shaping the terrain for future activists and future political leaders who, who may not think the way they do. And that's the contradictions of social movements. So it's not saying that Obama is, is, is somehow a new Malcolm X. It's saying that it's not just King who really help shift the landscape, right, and the tectonic plates underneath us um, to, to, to bring about an Obama. And I think that, uh, you know, I'm familiar with some of the, the criticism in terms of the, the, the picking out of, of candidate Obama and, and the corporate power and the influence, but I, but I think that a nuanced version of that w will show both these, these what you call power elites and corporate power, but also the way in which millions of ordinary people also gave um, 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 money to the campaign and organized and gave blood, sweat, and tears. So, Well, so like as, as a brother said to me on a plane, that would be like urinating in the ocean and claiming to have risen the tide. I mean, the point still remains as much as, and that's sort of what my point is, is that Wall Street funded him to the point uh, where it became a popular idea to support him by the millions of people with, with lesser amounts of money. It wasn't that they had developed him as part of a movement since most black people, most people, period, didn't know who he was before 2004. And this is sort of the point that I'm getting at. Yeah, but I don't think people were brainwashed somehow well, by I, I, Wall Street I, in I, terms I, of supporting him. Well, I completely disagree, and this is, what the, this is what the history of the development of propaganda in this country clearly has called for. This is what Bernays was talking about in the 20s with the development of an, of an invisible government that would put, develop, deliver us candidates uh, that we would choose from and, and make it seem as though, and it works the same way with music, it works the same thing with news stories. We are given choices that are acceptable to those in power and then we are left to fight over it. Uh, and, but see, but this is the point I'm really trying to get at and I know we only have a few minutes left with Dr. Peniel Joseph here on Midday Jazz and Justice on WPFW 89.3 FM. That the radical tectonic shifts that you're talking about um, can also be uh, uh, you know, um, used to describe the ways in which those in power have responded to people in this country and the oppression that we are still forced to deal with. As I said in that, that quick intro, the material conditions of black people and many others in this country is worse today than it was under Dr. King and Malcolm X. There is, you know, and there are many, um, every, really every major material indicator shows that this is the case. So the, the idea that their radical analysis wouldn't be applicable today is, 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 is I think misleading or, or just flat out wrong. Yeah, I didn't. But I, 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 I didn't that. say you said that. But my point. No, is, no, I, didn't, okay. I, I know I didn't say you said that. Okay, I'm saying okay. that to say that that by emphasizing this is why I keep going back to the points of emphasis, the selective points of emphasis on the more conservative redefinitions or or selections of black power is is what is I think misleading about the title and the cover of your book. I'm not saying so. So the tectonic shifts could also include things that you don't really focus on in this book. While you mention FBI and State Department surveillance of Malcolm and, and Kwame, you don't talk about the counterintelligence program uh, and certainly with no detail where they specifically set out to destroy this form of leadership. That's why I'm saying the, the more conservative strand of black power was intentionally developed and popularized not only by Nixon but by those who would support that, that view of it uh, and those in the black community who accepted that more conservative view of black power were promoted and given reward and while the more radical element of black power which was part of the real definition as though by those who created it in terms of the phrase black power was forced into the margins and intentionally destroyed. So, yeah, and but I not also, all of it was forced into the margins and that's some of the point well, 
point of the book. I mean, part of the, the most radical... But even in the quote you read from Malcolm X, he would certainly not look upon a Wall Street-funded candidate who has extended wars overseas, who has used his control or his, inf- or his influence over the federal budget to bail out everyone except the poor, who has, who has influenced black leadership to not focus on a black agenda and so on and so forth. He would not look at this as some sort of extension of uh, even a self-determining black power uh, 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 movement that he was helping to develop. I can't imagine. And really, the real question is, is could you have an Obama without first the physical assassination of, 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 of King and Malcolm, the later death of Kwame Ture, having all of them removed from the scene, having all of their analysis removed from the scene? That is what paves the way for this shift in, the, in, in what you're calling the, the transformation of, of American democracy and racial relationships. It is, it, it is, it is the popularity of certain forms of blackness absent that more radical political uh, uh, form that has allowed for Obama to become president. And it was a very propagandistic, uh, uh, which is even what they... Yeah, but you know, he, so. no, I, I can interrupt here, B. Jared. Yeah, I, mean, I think a couple of things. I mean, this is... And, and we saw this during the campaign. There were many different lines going on by different, both left-wing and right-wing and so-called progressive groups. And I think this is a line in the sense that the whole notion that Obama... And this is obviously, um, people like Amir Baraka and others disagreed with this, but the notion that Obama was just completely corporate funded, the notion that there was no people's m- mass movement, um, not just of over 66 million voters, but within the black community and within poor communities, that there weren't masses of people who not just gave funding, but organized in churches and community centers. I mean, I think that, that there, there has to be an acknowledgement that part of what brings Obama in is not just um, David Axelrod and, and, and Wall Street bo- brokers. And even if you're going to say, okay, they, they're the ones who popularized him and internal. Well, they brought him in, things, but they did bring there, him in. There, there's, 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 there's definitely going to be a movement um, in 2008, especially after Iowa, but even, even before of young people. It's not just young white people. Um, it's African Americans as well. And it's not just African American elites and college professors. It's people at the beauty shops and barber shops who 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 want um, Obama to be elected. And I don't think that these people are somehow lemmings who are just who who are just. Uh, well, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, pushed, but the, pushed, the, but the, pushed, but, pushed but, into but, this. But Professor this, Joseph, like, the reality still remains that were was he not funded and selected by the most elite elements of the society, none of these things you're describing as movements could have existed. These were not grassroots, community-based, originated movements. They were responses encouraged by the very power structure against which people like Kwame and uh, and Malcolm uh, uh, struggled to develop something that is now called, as you said in the book, uh, a de facto black leader. So we have the very problem that many of these people, men and women, have been struggling for decades was the self-determination they were talking about was we choose our leadership and they are beholden to us. You are now describing self-determination as the Wall Street and the corporate elite saying, here is your leader, now develop a movement that will put him in office. That is an entirely um, uh, disconnected, yeah, that, mutually that, exclusive I don't, reality. I, don't, I disagree with the premise that that's exactly what happened in 2008. Well, I, I, think take, that, I think that um, well, whether it's I, other candidates that have happened at other times in history, whether it's like candidacies of, of, of John Edwards or whoever, I don't think that um, masses of people, especially for the first black candidate, Certainly it's going to be more complicated than this notion that he was somehow a community organizer and it was just the people themselves who, 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 who wanted him to be elected president, and then he was. But the, the, the people in a broad way, especially African Americans, Latinos, poor people, um, do have a collective sense of, of, of trying to get him elected uh, in 2008. And I don't think, I don't think that can be discounted um, by, the, by the left or by, by people who are... Who are um, it's not to be discounted. It's to be put in the context of the role of media yeah, but and, you're, you're, and, po- it's, it's and electoral like your politics. Point throughout the um, yeah. conversation, Jared, it's a point of emphasis because you're emphasizing solely the Wall Street um, um, corporate power behind him, and by that you de-emphasize. It's like the new book, Game Changer. What that the game change? What that book emphasizes is sort of the um, sort of Machiavellian politics that are going within individual campaigns. 
And one, you don't necessarily see the corporate influence, and two, you don't see the grassroots. Well, but of course, and, points and what of you're emphasis, doing is that's de-emphasizing the point. The, 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 the grassroots. In the same way uh, you de-emphasize the more radical elements of black power to fit the larger narrative you're dis- developing. We yeah, all have I, selected is, points in, of in case, emphasis. I'm not case, denying that. interpretation because okay. the, the more yeah. radical elements are, I, it, they're discussed throughout. And I don't, I don't somehow um, clip Malcolm and Kwame Touré of their radicalism. That's, that's no, a, I'm that's not saying, again, I'm not saying you do that. I'm saying that you emphasize elements of and redefine elements of black power. Your, your, your emphasis and redefinition of self-determination as just one example is, is part of my evidence that is suggesting that you have selected and redefined and uh, uh, selected for emphasis elements to create your narrative. I'm doing the same thing, although I would argue that in terms of emphasizing Wall Street, I mean, you, you, you can't say, you can't, they don't, they're not, there's not a parallel here in terms of uh, grassroots community development of a candidate and a Wall Street funding. Without the Wall Street funding, there would have been no Obama. In the yeah, grassroots, but without the grassroots, without the grassroots but the, support, there would have been and the no grassroots, Obama either. Right, that's, but the grassroots support. Point. But that's the grassroots point. without the grassroots. But the support. grassroots support was developed and funded and supported and encouraged by the very mechanisms of power that the real black power movement was trying to destroy. So that's what I'm just trying to highlight. Now, unfortunately, you said you had to go in, in an hour, yeah, and I, I understand do. the situation you're dealing with. And again, I wish you you the best with that. And uh, whenever you you like, or we can range. Uh, we, you're welcome to come back, and we can conclude this. Uh, but unfortunately, we have to leave it there. It's 2 o'clock. This is WPFW 89.3 FM. Uh, let me just say again, Dr. Peniel Joseph, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Your book, Dark Days, Bright Nights, uh, From Black Power to Obama, can be uh, gotten in any number of different places, and yeah, including and the your website. website. Yeah, please give My the website. My website is uh, www.penielejoseph.com, and that's P-E-N-I-E-L-E-J-O-S-E-P-H.com. All right. Again, thank you very much, and uh, good luck with, with uh, the <laughs> right, emergency, and, and we'll talk to you soon. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody. Midday Jazz and Justice, WPFW 89.3 FM. I uh, hope you uh, enjoyed that. We're going to get into some music, catch up on uh, some information for you, and uh, open up the phone lines at 202-588-0893, 202-588-0893 for responses to this discussion. Please make that the central point of your your comments again this is midday jazz and justice more importantly this is wpfw 89.3 fm back in just a minute peace oh say can you see through all the lies and bigotry that has plagued this country for so many centuries And they have the nerve to say they're all about democracy. But actually, it's hypocrisy and greed. You have stolen, told lies to control all of our lives. But freedom will never die. And our people will survive And we'll rise like the sun We'll take on whatever may come We'll breed generations Of Malcolms and Martins Now why should I fight Dying for a country That don't give a damn about me We must fight the powers that be Or you will always be a slave